Well, let's prepare ourselves. The spiritual truth I'm looking with today, working with today. No, let, let's prepare ourselves. <laughs> let's not get so stirred up. You don't know what you're doing up here. <laughs> you open your eyes. I see the spiritual truth today. I open my ears to hear the spiritual truth today. If you just open your arms up, I open my heart to receive the spiritual truth today. The spiritual truth that I'm working with is that you are never alone. You are never alone. Now, I work with that a lot, and I try and come at it at different ways because I want us to get it deeper and deeper and deeper. You are never alone. The presence of the living God is with you all of the time. It is in you, it is through you, it is with you all of the time. See, our teaching is this. There is no separation. There is no way for you to separate yourself. No way for you to separate yourself from the presence of the living God that is within you right now. You can lose your limb. You can lose your vision. You can lose your keys. You can lose whatever you want, but you cannot lose the spirit of the living God that is within you. You have access to it all of the time. Now, here's the problem. We don't access it all of the time, and that's our work. That's why we come to a spiritual community like this, to learn some ways of thinking, to learn some ways of being, to learn some new spiritual practices that will enable us to understand how to access this universal presence. But here's the one thing you need to know. You don't need an intermediary to do it. You have access to the universal presence all of the time. You don't need Buddha. You don't need Jesus. You don't need Lao Tzu. You don't need a rabbi. You don't need a minister. You don't need me. You don't need anybody. You don't need a sacred text. Now, all of those may assist you if you choose, but you don't need them. Here's what you need. Here's what you must have. And that is a willingness to make a decision. Because you're always at choice. You have choice. That's what you need to make the decision to access. To access your choice. Now, look, there's an easier, softer way of connecting up with the universal presence, and there's a harder way to connect up with the universal presence. The easier, softer way is through prayer, through meditation, through visioning. Those are the easier, softer ways. And if you're doing those, that's great. Keep it up. But most of us, most of us hear the voice of the universal presence that is giving us constantly broadcasting information to us. We hear that voice through other people, other universal presences, other spirits dressed up in meat suits. Those are our guides. Those are the ones who are helping us understand. Our soul is in constant conversation with us. And sometimes our soul is in conversation with other spiritual beings' souls. It's sort of you heard that phrase, my people will call your people? <laughs> well, your soul's saying, I'm calling some people in here to help me with this. Because your soul is always wanting to help you grow. Sometimes those meat suits, sometimes those spiritual guides look like your neighbor. Sometimes they look like your spouse. Sometimes they look like your ex. Sometimes They look like somebody in recovery who's sitting next to you. Sometimes they look like your doctor. Sometimes those spirit beings that are trying to assist you with universal information are your children. Sometimes they're your mortgage brokers. Sometimes those people are your office mates or maybe even they're your cellmates. But they may be trying to give you information so that you can have access to the universal presence that is always trying to talk to you. Here's the most important thing I'm going to say today. If you are bringing in people 
who are helping you grow happily or helping you be uncomfortable and grow, know this, your soul called them in. Your soul got right on the phone and talked to their soul and said, you better come on over here. Reverend Georgia needs a little help because she wants to have a growth spurt. We know that the way that the universe works is not always to make us comfortable. The way the universe works is this. When I'm ready to have a growth spurt, the universe will begin to organize itself to assist me. That's how the universe works. When I'm ready to have a growth spurt, the universe will organize itself in order to assist me. Now, here's the thing. My soul may know it wants a growth spurt before my noggin (laughs) understands it's time for a growth spurt. In fact, it might be even fighting it. See, my soul knew I was called to ministry, that I was called to teach and to preach way before my mind did. Our soul often knows when it's time for, it's sort of like the caterpillar. The caterpillar's soul knows when it's time for it to crawl out on a branch and stop and be ready to be a butterfly. Now, I don't know whether the soul, the caterpillar's brain knows that, but the soul knows that. Ernest Holmes would say it this way, your universal spirit is talking to the individualized spirit. Many of you remember that game, Mother May I? Do you remember that game, Mother May I? It's kind of like your soul is playing that game. Great mother, may I have some assistance with the way I gossip? And great mother says, sure, of course. And if you are willing to work hard in consciousness, that will just happen now because you have made that intention to get help with your gossip. But if you fall asleep, now that I know that your soul wants growth in this area, I will help you. I will help you. I will send some people, and you may be tempted to gossip about them, and the consequence will remind you of your desire, your soul's desire. You might be saying, Great Mother, may I? Have some help to get my head out of the sand because my relationship feels funny right now. And I've just been putting my head in the sand. And great mother will say, yes, of course. I'm going to send you help. And if you do it connected to me in consciousness, after you've set this intention, it will simply happen. But if you fall asleep, I will send the... the, uh, Straw that broke the camel's back right into your relationship. Great mother, may I have some help shaking this drama that I keep bringing into my life? Sure, of course you can. But if you fall asleep after you've set this intention, after you've recognized this, I'm going to have to call some people (laughs) to help you. Great mother, can I have some help with my addiction? I've been backsliding. I haven't been drinking. I haven't been using. But I've been backsliding in my recovery. Sure. Sure, I'm going to send you that help. And if you don't go to sleep, it'll be easy breezy if you do the things you know you need to do to stay clean and sober. But if you fall asleep, I may have to let you spend a little bit of time in a hospital or in a jail cell or some other time out so that you can get it clearer. Many of you who are familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale, that's what happened. Jonah got some time out. (laughs) Those of you who aren't familiar with it, his soul had a desire In the Bible, it says God told him, but we know in metaphysics, his soul had a desire to be a prophet and a preacher and a teacher. And his mind did what you and I do. He began to argue. No, other people could do it better. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Other people could do it better. Because his soul had set such a firm intention, the universal spirit was organizing to help him whether his mind wanted 
him to or not. And when it, his arguing didn't sort of dissipate his soul's desire, he decided to take a geographic. Now, I know a lot of you in this room besides me took more than one geographic in our lives. Huh? We went somewhere, but unfortunately, everywhere we went, there we were. <laughs> and he did. He took this geographic. He hops about to Spain. But the universe was already in working order to support him. And so a great storm came up. And you'd think the fear from the storm might do it. But no, he slept through the storm. Now, I know I'm not the only person who stepped through some storms in my life. But the universe was still working. And so it sent some meat suits to help him. His soul called some peeps and said, you need to come up here. And they did. And they tossed him right off the ship. <laughs> and he landed in the belly of a whale for three days. Now, I, when I was younger and I heard this story, I never really listened to too many Bible stories, but this one kind of caught my eye. And I thought, three full, that's a lot of time. But as an adult, as somebody who's working on my spiritual practice, I can tell you I've spent way longer than three days in the darkness. Way longer. But finally, he got it. He got it. His mind and his soul began to connect with the universal soul and the universal spirit, and he knew. And when he knew, when he finally surrendered to what his soul was calling him to, the whale spit him out right onto Nineveh so he could begin his work as a preacher and a teacher and a prophet. See, it's important for us to know that when we're done with our soul, the whale spits us out for the good of other people. When we go through our dark nights or our bellies of the whale or our times out, we need to know that when we come back up, it's time to give the wisdom from the heartache that we just got. See, I always say, I don't want to hear from people who haven't fallen down. I want to hear from the people who fell down, and I want to see how they got back up. That's our work, to become a spiritual chain reaction. Now, I've been, I've been contemplating. This is a book called Living the Science of Mind, and if you don't have this book and you're not in foundation, foundation students, you can't have this book yet, okay? Because you already have your book, and I want you to have that book, okay? <laughs> but if you have, don't have this book, and you've kind of looked through the science of mind, and you think, oh, my God, this guy, I don't understand him, I want you to pick this book up. It's called Living the Science of Mind, and for some reason he had a revelation, and he stopped writing in the same manner that he wrote the textbook. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So these are just chuck full of essays on different subjects. And I love this book, and I, I read it frequently, and then I try and contemplate what it's saying. This one is How to Create a, 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 a Spiritual Chain Reaction. And here's the first sentence, the first thing. And I think we have this. Oh, good. Uh, no one lives entirely by himself. We are all individual parts of humanity. And whether or not we realize it, each is, an inf is influencing those around him, and each in his turn is being influenced by others. No doubt the thoughts and opinions and actions of the whole world finally are based on what everyone thinks and believes. So it's powerful to think of us going through something and then beginning to share it with each other, because that's what I believe we're all here for. I believe we're all here to shine the light for one another on how to get back on the path, how to get back, get back in harmony with our natural spirit. Well, we're a practical church, and so I, I've come up with three little things we could do, little tiny things we could do to become the spiritual chain reaction that I know you all want to. The first one is to begin to understand that all change starts with you. All change starts with you. 
turn to a neighbor and say, she's talking to you. <laughs> okay. Here's what's important. We all want peace. But before we go to the next peace rally, before we sing the next peace song, let's look in our heart. Where are we carrying anything that is unlike peace? Because we need to clean that up in order for us to be able to be chain reactions in terms of bringing more peace onto the planet. We've got to begin to clean that up. If you're rehashing any old conversation that you're just over and over and over rehashing, you're not at peace. Invite yourself to call one person this week that you might be having some separation from for whatever reason. Maybe you need to forgive them, but you're not ready to forgive them. But maybe you'd be willing to have at least an opening phone call with them. An opening phone call that would just say, you know, I think there's some stuff between us. Can we talk about it? Doing that will elevate peace on the planet much more. Now, I'm all for peace marches and all that stuff. But it will elevate peace on the planet. And then if you can really get into forgiving somebody. Now, look, if you come to this church, you have no, and you have stuff before anybody, Reverend Betsy's workshop should be overflowing. <laughs> overflowing. Because we have the skills to share with you how to clean that up without killing yourself. Without, you know, making yourself <laughs> bad or mad. So begin to do that. You know, I, I went to Landmark once and... Um, uh, you know, you go in there and you spend all day and then they say, okay, we're letting you go home now at 7 o'clock because you have to make five phone calls to somebody that you're not talking to before you come back in the morning. And you have to identify them. And you know what? I resisted that and resisted that and I resisted that. And my brother and I don't fight. We don't fight. We don't need, we, 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 we just don't fight but we're not close because we don't want to fight. So I called him up, and I said, you know, I think there's stuff between us. And I'm glad we don't fight, but I feel like we don't fight because we stay away from each other. Kind of like when you were eight, and your mother would put you in one room and another room, you know? And we kind of stayed there. After that phone call, we have had a much closer relationship. Now, the interesting thing is we fight like cats and dogs now. <laughs> but we are connected to each other. We're connected to each other. The second thing is develop the spiritual gift of learning how to say goodbye to those people who are ready to release you, even if you're not ready to be released. You know, so many of us have kind of a, a spiritual glue stick that we've been putting on on relationships, and I'm not talking about love relationships only, but all kinds of relationships. Sometimes our adult children just need a little break from us, you know? Whatever it is, begin to develop this, and it's not easy. That's why we call it spiritual practice. It's not easy because we want those people still in our lives. We're, we're, we don't think that we're ready, but if their soul is calling them for growth, we have to let them go and grow, and then we'll grow in the same way. You know, it was hard for me to let go of people in recovery. I had to let go of people because it wasn't good for me to stay around with them, and that was painful for me. I've had people leave this church who I dearly loved because it wasn't Christ-centered enough. They wanted the Bible every week, and it was painful for me to let them go. And I even held on for a while. And I'd throw Jesus in the sermon every week to try and <laughs> what did he say, you know. But the truth is, I had to let them go. Developing the spiritual practice of letting go. The last one I love to do at least once a year here 
And, uh, and uh, <coughs> that's to invite you to set off a spiritual chain reaction by not complaining for 21 days. No complaint, 21 days. Okay? And if you go for 18 days and it just flies out of your mouth, back to day one. Did I say 21 consecutive days? That's what I meant to say. So I have a little phrase that we teach here that will make it easier. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. We're, we're just naturally blah, blah, blah. So here's the phrase. God, that's great. Can you say that, Can you say that with me? So somebody cut you off on the highway? God, that's great. Somebody hurt your feelings at work? God, that's great. Okay, so that's our work for 21 days. That's the phrase. God, that's great. All right? All right, let's take this message into prayer. Knowing that you are in the heart and the mind and the love of the Most High God, that one presence that always says yes that universal presence that is individualized through me, I simply turn my attention to it. I turn my attention to the understanding that God is always here, never anywhere else, always just right here, always saying yes. I affirm and accept and end a compassionate end to homelessness and the universe begins to organize itself and says, yes. I accept and affirm a compassionate end to hunger, and the universe organizes and says, yes. I affirm and accept an end to any pain that comes from being left this day, and the universe organizes and says, yes. Simply, I bring this into my heart and my mind, knowing that God is love, that I am love, that we are love. I give thanks for this. I release this word into the law, and together we say, and so it is.